Blessings upon blessings and welcome to Promises Cup Ministry. I am Minister Deborah and I will be bringing forth the word today. We are going to continue and finish our study on the benefits of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and let us go to one of our main scriptures, which is found in Hebrews 13. And I'm going to be reading verse 5. And the word reads, let your character, your moral essence, your inner nature be free from the love of money, shun greed, be financially ethical, being content with what you have. For he says, I will never under any circumstances desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support nor will I in any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. Father God, we just wanna thank you for this time. We wanna thank you for this moment. Lord God, I pray, Father God, let every ear that is under the sound of my voice, Lord, hear the words that you have for them, Lord God. Let us receive it in its total, Father God, as we end this wonderful, wonderful topic of the benefits of Jesus Christ. Let our hearts receive, Lord, and let our lives live fully unto you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So once again, we're going to be talking about... <clears throat> The benefits of Jesus Christ. A few weeks ago, I spoke about the fruits of the Spirit, which are benefits. That's peace, joy, happiness, gladness, a sound mind, gentleness, empathy, sympathy, faithfulness, meekness. These are the benefits of having Jesus in our lives. Why? Because these things cannot be bought. These things we receive from Jesus when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. These are things that can only be taught by him. We may see others that have it, but when we truly desire it, when we truly bring it before God, he's the one that teaches us with time, how to receive these things in our lives. So if you need patience, start paying for that patience. And slowly, you're going to see yourself working into the fullness of it. If you need a peace of mind, start praying for that sounds mind. And you're going to see Jesus. Christ, start working in you. When you give him your thoughts, when you give him your anxieties, when you give him your worries, when you give him all these things, you start to receive the peace and you don't react the same way that you used to. I spoke about the Corinthians. You know, Paul had to write them two letters. In one letter, he says, Throw out that person that is bringing strife amongst you. In the second letter, he said, now that you've thrown him out, bring him back so that you can, so that he won't become discouraged, so that you can show him the way. Show him that you have the fruits of the spirit within you. Show him that acceptance. So that in time, his mind is going to be renewed. His belief is going to change. This is what happens. This is what happens amongst any church. You will see it. There's not a church that I've been to that has not had some type of strife. That has not had some type of disagreement amongst the members. And I've been in church a very long time. I mean, I started going to church when I was little. And I've seen it. I've seen many things happen within the Christian community. Now, is that a bad thing? Absolutely not. 
It just showcased humanity. It just showcased how we need one another, how we need compassion, how we need love, how we need acceptance, how we need forgiveness. This is what this shows. Now I want you to turn with me to <clears throat> Galatians chapter four. And let me make sure I'm starting at the same thing. Okay. I'm going to be reading <clears throat> starting at verse 21. And I'm going to go over a little bit into chapter five, but I want you to keep up with me. Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? Do we? And what does it mean to live under the law? It means to live under the old covenant. You see, when we receive Jesus Christ, we no longer were under that law. And what do I mean by law? It's about 613 rules. I mean, there's not a soul in the Bible that kept up with all 613. They all had their trips and falls where they had to come back up, where they needed God. It says in the Bible that the law was given so that we can learn our dependency on God. And we see throughout the Bible that the Israelites were God's chosen people. But they always missed the mark. And when I say missed the mark, I'm talking about they showed their humanity. That's what the law is. It is something that <clears throat> no human can really keep. It hasn't been done. Jesus Christ is the only one that came into the world and perfected his will of God over his life. No one else could do that. To the cross, he did it. Is he showing us this is the way that you need to live? This is the way that you need to be? The word says that he knew when he understood human nature. So that means that he could relate to everything you and I have gone through and will go through. But when we understand that God and Jesus are one. And the purpose as to why Jesus Christ came as human nature. He did it to be an example, to be a mediator. To go to God before us so that he can plead for our lives, which is what he did on the cross. He died on the cross so that we can live a new life. And that's the new covenant. And in the next few months, that's what we're going to be learning. Is the new covenant in Christ Jesus and what it is and understanding it. But first we need to understand the benefits. And that's what I've been talking about the past few weeks. And that's what I'm ending with now. So again, verse 21, tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from a slave woman and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promises. And what was that promise? God promised Abraham a son from his wife, Sarah, who was far beyond her age of childbearing. That is made very clear throughout the story of Abraham and Sarah. 
She was old, he was old, and they were way past that age. So what did Sarah do? Sarah gave Abraham one of her maidservants and said, here, sleep with her and see if God will fulfill his promise there. That's what she did. So this is the story that we're talking about. We're talking about the one made in human form, which is his son Ishmael, and the one that God promised, which is Isaac. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promises. Give me one second. These two women served as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai because she and her child live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman and she is our mother. As the book of Isaiah says, rejoice, O childless woman, you who have never given birth, break into a joyful shout. You who have never been in labor, for the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, he's talking to us, are children of the promise just like Isaac. But you are not being persecuted for those. Oh, hold on. But you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law, just as Ishmael the child born of human effect. He persecuted Isaac, the child born of the power of the spirit. But what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son. For the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance of the free son. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the freeborn woman. And why am I reading this, you're asking yourself? Because this has to do with who we were before Jesus Christ and who we are when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. These two sons represent the covenants of God over our lives. Galatians 5, for Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ is of no benefit to you. Again. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then God is of no benefit to you. I say it again. If you are trying to find favor with God for being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have Falling off from Christ. Wow. Paul, the person who is writing this, was cut off from Christ with what he was doing when he was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. When he was going after anyone. And when I tell you he was going after anyone who confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
He was killing men, women, and children. He didn't care. He wanted them all behind bars. He wanted them to disappear. Why? Because the word says that he was so zealous for God. He had such a passion for God's word and God's law. So when he talks about here, you are cut off. He was cut off. Until, until he had that encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, where he was going to persecute more Christians because he thought that he was doing the right thing for God. He thought that that's what he was supposed to be doing at that time for him. For if you are making, trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. And what is God's grace? God's grace is Jesus Christ. God's grace is Jesus Christ on that cross. God's grace finds no fault, past, present, and future. Your sins are forgiven. That's his grace. And it says here that if we try to keep up with the law, then Christ is of no benefit to us. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised. For when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, there is no benefit of being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. You were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? <clears throat> you know who holds us back? You know, we like to blame people for things that happen to us. But sometimes the person who's holding us back is us. It's you, it's me. It's our past way of thinking before we met Jesus. It's our lifestyle before we met Jesus. It's our friends before we met Jesus. You know, when Jesus Christ comes into our life, everything changes. I know anyone that's on this line right now, can think of a time that when they met Jesus Christ and they accepted him into their lives and they confessed his name and they received their salvation. I'm sure that you can think of a time where you started hanging out with old friends or in that conversation like you always were and you're thinking and your spirit started to tell you, oh, this is wrong. This is not right. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't have that conversation. I shouldn't entertain that. I shouldn't go there. There's nothing wrong with you. That's your inner man telling you, you no longer live this way. Sometimes it's difficult for us to receive the new man. You see here, he's talking to the Galatians. This is Paul writing his letter and telling them who, who has done this to you? So that means probably the same people that were amongst the Corinthians when they got thrown out, when they got displaced, when they were received again. Still, this is someone fighting amongst themselves. They went over to the Galatians and started whispering the same exact things. I call this the person who hasn't received their new man. Who hasn't accepted the change that the Holy Spirit has placed within them. 
And sometimes we think it's a bad thing. Sometimes we think it's wrong not to hang around that family member, not to be around that crowd. We even notice it in our speech at times. Oh, I no longer speak the same. Or sometimes when you're around a certain group, you start to talk a different way than what Christ has placed inside of you. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's God changing the inner man. And when we're able to recognize it, and when we're able to acknowledge it, that's where the change really starts to happen. Why? Because we're no longer in denial. We receive the Holy Spirit's interaction within our souls. And when we receive that interaction within our souls, it's shown outwardly. It's shown in the exterior. It's shown with our behavior. And that's what God wants us to benefit. He wants us to benefit in such a way that we no longer live the same way that we used to. <clears throat> we all have our story. We all have our testimony. For some of us and most of us, and I say most of us because you should always be teachable. God should always be able to teach you something new. God should always be guiding us to the mark. Guiding us to where it is that he wants us to go. We should always be learning in his wisdom. And you get wisdom by the Holy Spirit. You gain wisdom by prayer. You gain wisdom by reading the word of God. You get wisdom by the conversations that you have and who you have it with. This is the way that you get godly wisdom. And this is the way that you learn. When you see things, when you start to see things differently, when you receive the love of Jesus Christ, you gain this faith that talks like Hebrews 13, that he will never leave you nor forsake you, that he will always be there for you. He will never leave you without. He will never lose his grip on you. You know, there's a meme, now that I think about it, there's a meme about, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but I've seen it several times, of a baby with rice in its hand. If you look at that grip, that baby who can't speak, that baby who has Knowledge of an infant, like the word says, is still drinking milk. But when you see that grip, he's not letting go of that rice. And it makes it really difficult for a parent to open that grip to stop that child from eating it. I'm going to tell you now that that's the same grip that God has on you and I. And why am I comparing it with a child? <clears throat> because anyone who has dealt with an infant child who wants to hold on to something, it's going to make it difficult for us to remove that thing. We're going to have to physically fight. Let me not say physically because you probably think I'm beating the child or something. But you're going to have to struggle. And you're going to have to sometimes beg the child to let that thing go. God's grip on you is stronger than that. There's no devil in hell that's going to win. There's no devil on earth that's going to win. When the word of God says that he has that grip on you, there's nothing possible that you can be going through 
that's going to make God loosen his hand and his grip on you. There's nothing. So I don't care what the enemy may be telling you, what circumstance the devil may have placed before you, what your friends are telling you, what your neighbors are telling you, what you're telling yourself. It doesn't matter what you're feeling, what emotion is being met at that time. God is not going to lose his grip on you. I like the word, I like the way the word says it and puts into example Abraham's two sons. Because one was made through human nature and the other one was made through the spirit. It is a promise of God. And it puts the two covenants, it puts those two men as an example. Why is it that the Bible is always giving us example and example and example because we're humans and we need to learn and understand the difference between what we do in human nature and what it is that God promises us. It's just like the story of the prodigal son. He asked his father for his riches. His father gave it to him. He went. He spent it all to the point where he was eating pig food. And then he comes to his reason. He comes to his senses. And he says, let me return to my father. Even if I'm a slave, I will have a better place than what I have now. That father also had another son who stood with him, who stood by his side who never left him. He didn't ask for his riches. He said, when it's my time to inherit, I will inherit. And the word says that when the father saw his prodigal son coming from afar, he ran and he embraced him and he loved him. And he made a feast on his behalf. And he received him back as his son. He said, what was lost has not been found. And that's you and I before Jesus Christ. And then after. There's promises over your life. Some you may know already. And some you haven't discovered. But don't grow faint and don't lose heart. Whatever God has spoken over your life, it is going to be so. Sarah was 99 years old when she gave birth to Isaac. That's way far beyond their age. Now they say, if you're 48 years old, you're too old. But if it's God's will for a woman to give birth at that age, guess what? It's going to be God's will, and she's going to give birth at that age. Now they scare you with all these <coughs> generic disorders and diseases that may happen. But I'm going to tell you, if it's God's will, it's going to happen. That means that regardless of what age you are, regardless of your past, regardless of your workplace, regardless of where you live, regardless of where you used to live, regardless of the drugs you used to take, the alcohol you used to drink, it is God's will for you to be delivered. <laughs> it is God's will for you to be set free. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, right. 
sorry. So it doesn't matter. Because whatever God says, it is going to be so. Hmm. So the benefit of today's topic is your new man, your new nature. I want you to take on that new nature in your life. Don't allow another day to go back to who you used to be, to the way you used to live. <clears throat> Make a stand today. Tell the Holy Spirit, I want to live in my new nature. Every day of the remainder of my life, I want to live in my new nature. So, Lord, if I'm not living in my new nature, please make it evident to me. Allow me to see it with my own eyes. Show me in my heart. Let my spirit know that this is not the way that you want me to live. And guess what? He's going to start working in you. And you will notice the difference. By the end of the week, you're going to start to notice the difference. There's no lie in that. So that's what I want you to take away with you this week. To live in your new nature. And reap the benefits of your new man. Now... <clears throat> If you would like to give to Promises Kept Ministry, you can. Through Cash App at Promises Kept Ministry. You can give through PayPal at Promises Kept Ministry. Or Zelle at Promises Kept Ministry at Yahoo.com. Now let us go into our offering song. One of the best ways that we can prove that we love the Lord is by giving. Amen. So we're going to sing a song about giving, and it's got some hand motions, and I want you to join with me, okay? Will you do that? Here we go. Watch me. Give, and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, and running over. Give, and it will come back to you. When you give, Give to the Lord. Help me out now. Here we go. Give, and it will come back to you. Good measure. Press down, shake it together, and running over. Give, and it will come back to you. When you give, give to the Lord. Give in love. Give in faith. Give with joy and a smile on your face. Give as the Lord has given to you. All you give is a reflection of your gratitude. So give, and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, and ride it over. Give, and it will come back to you. When you give, give to the Lord. From your heart, give your best. Give unto God, and you will be blessed. Don't be stingy, and don't be tight. Learn from the widow in the Bible, who gave her last night. So give, and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, and ride it over the Give, and it will come back to you. When you give, to the Lord. Yeah. 
Just now, shake it together and rock it over again. And it's good to do when you get to the Lord. You've got to do it again. And it's good to come back to you. Good night, just now, shake it together and rock it over again. And it's good to do when you get to the Lord. You've got to do it again. And it's good to come back to you. So, Lord, as we depart from this place, but never from your presence, Lord, may you continue to lead and guide us. May your love show evident in our everyday lives. And may we continue to live our lives according to your perfect will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.